So uh, today we're going to talk about prayers. And uh, before we get a little bit deeper into the subject of the prayers and Vantana, which is one of the uh, processes of devotion, one of the nine processes of devotional service, uh, we'll take a look a little bit of the verse itself. So when Brahma is offering prayers to Lord Krishna, he's describing him. So he is glorifying his uh, Madhurya form, the form that he has as a cowherd boy in Guloka Vrindavan. So this is like a meditation, a glorification of the Lord, description of his beautiful qualities, and also an indication that to this form, not the Vishnu forms that Lord Brahma saw before that when he Krishna revealed the cowherd boys, actually when he revealed himself as the cowherd boys and showed his opulence of the Vishnu forms. Now he is actually surrendering not to Vishnu form, but to Lord Krishna as a cowherd boy. And the words that he uses uh, also speak philosophical conclusions about Lord Krishna. And this is something that... Uh, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur uh, emphasizes in his commentary to this verse, and I will read it because it's very nice. So, uh, this is a commentary of Vishwana Chakravati Thakur. So, he paraphrases the words of Brahma. Or simply to please you, I glorify you in verse. Your transcendental body, dark blue like a fresh rain cloud, is wrapped in a garment more brilliant than lightning. And then he says, Brahma, Brahma's words describing Krishna suggest two things. The earth gets relieved from the scorching heat of summer through the cloud of Krishna's rain. So it's a nice metaphor because Krishna did appear in his uh, incarnation as Lord Krishna to actually reveal the suffering of the earth. So he comes as a cloud and we know that when the earth is thirsty and dry, it gets relieved from the clouds that pour rain down to the earth. So in that same way, when, when Lord Brahma saw Krishna, uh, he saw him also in a metaphor of Krishna in that form bringing relief um, to the residents of the material world. And then he says, and the Chataka bird-like bird devotees sustain their lives with the mercy pouring, pouring from the rain cloud of Krishna. So we know from the scriptures how Chataka birds, they, they are actually um, a very special birds because they only drink waters, water from the clouds. They don't want to take water from any other place. And, um, and they, will, they will also go to the clouds when they see him, this uh, dark bluish cloud, they will uh, fly to it expecting rain, but sometimes the cloud would uh, throw thunderbolts at them. But despite that fact, so whether it's good or bad, good in the sense of getting rain and water that sustains them, or lightning which can actually harm them, they will anyway always be, um, how do you say, uh, not dedicated, oh yeah, we can say de dedicated and devoted to the cloud and they will not go any, anywhere else. And uh, the last time when I was giving the class, I was talking about uh, four types of hearers, like what, ki what kind of types of person, no, what kind of mood should we have when we hear uh, the topics of Krishna. And then we said that there are four types of hearers. Uh, we have fish, a swan, uh, a parrot and a chataka bird. So this is also a significance how this metaphor is also used because devotee is like a chataka bird because he never goes any place else. He always drinks uh, from the source of his uh, nourishment and the source that gives him nectar and ecstasy and that is Srimad Bhagavatam for example or he worships Krishna because Krishna is the source of everything and which he is according to the scripture. Um, so he only devotee like Chataka, devotee like Chataka, yeah, 
No, Chataka bird like devotee, sorry. <laughs> Chataka bird like devotee always goes there. He, he doesn't uh, search uh, with speculation uh, to find um, Krishna, nor does he want to have mystic powers or something like that. So he always acts in devotional service towards Krishna, expecting um, mercy. And that is something that uh, Lord Brahma will touch upon in the prayers. Uh, where he says that a person who performs uh, devotional service, this is my paraphrasation of the verse, so the person who performs devotional service with determination and patience uh, to get the mercy of the Lord uh, becomes his legitimate right just because he's performing it. So he has, like, in a way, the right to it because the Lord is merciful and He's just going that direction, and this is the result which he will have, which he will get. Then Brahma continues. Gun uh, Gunja berry earrings uh, accent the beauty of your face. Flowers adorn your hair, and a peacock feather rests atop your head. And then Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur says, Brahma's description reveals the superiority of the lowly Gunja lowly Gunja berries of Raja to the precious jewels of Vaikuntha. So these berries, I mean, it's also, um, I think, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that Sanatan Goswami is giving um, a commentary on Damodarashtakam, uh, where these um, earrings of Damodar are mentioned. And when Sanatan Goswami is um, describing the verse, He's saying how devotees are actually jealous of the earrings because the earrings, when they go, how, how is it said? They swing, they touch the cheeks of Krishna. So therefore, they are very near to Krishna. So devotees are very jealous because the earrings can be so close and they cannot. So in the same sense, the guja berries are glorified <laughs> because they... They were given the position to stand on Krishna's ears, so how exalted they are. And also because we know that the supreme form, Bhagavan Svayam, is Lord Krishna. And, um, and we know that why. He's like that because he's the source of uh, everything, the cause of all causes. But also uh, he has this quality of sweetness that the devotees, especially in our Sampradaya, hanker for. So they want to have an intimate relationship with Krishna. And the Gunja berries, they have this intimate relationship with Krishna in a way, more than jewels in Vaikuntha. Because in uh, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, it is described, uh, amongst uh, other things that are described there, uh, how, um, how Narayan, Lord Narayan, is worshipped on Vaikuntha planets. And um, he's there praised with awe and reverence, and everyone is serving him in the mood of uh, a servant uh, and also as a friend, but uh, with more awe and reverence friendship. Uh, there, you don't eat with Lord Narayan. He, he eats with his consorts, um, so everyone has to leave while, while he takes lunch, while Lord Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan, when a devotee happens to be around his house and he's having lunch, dinner or breakfast, it doesn't matter. He's invited to come and sit at the table and Krishna is being served by his mother Yashoda and his father Nanda Maharaj. But this devotee, he just gets like the remnants of, uh, of, of what Krishna is eating and Radharani, she makes like the best ladus for Krishna and Krishna doesn't want to eat them, he just tries a little bit and he doesn't like the taste, even though Radharani is the most uh, exalted cook. We all know that when uh, she cooks, she never cooks the same meal. The meal is always different. And I was sometimes thinking, like, what does that mean? And, uh, you know, how devotees sometimes they can also make a meal that is with the same ingredients, but the meal is never the same because it always depends on the consciousness. So I thought of it like maybe her, you know, her love grows and with each preparation of the meal, the <laughs> meal is more devotional. So in that sense, it's always different because it's like the different, everything is changeable 
in the mood of an, an emotion and devotion. So, uh, so Lord Krishna doesn't want to eat her ladus, and then he gives, in this case, it is described in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, when Gopakumar returns finally to Goloka Vrindavan, he, is, he has his name there, uh, his name is Svarup, and he's, he's invited to lunch uh, at Krishna's place. And Krishna doesn't want to eat these ladus that Radharani prepared, so he gives it to Gopakumar. So this is like the mercy and the sweetness of Lord Krishna, where he exhibits this intimate relationship with his devotees, and he shares actually everything that he has, he shares with them. And it, we know in the in descriptions in the 13th, 13th, 13th chapter, when uh, the boys, cowherd boys, were having lunch with Krishna, they all brought their own like food, and then they exchanged, will you please take a little bit of me, a little bit of what I have? So they shared, and Krishna shared with them. And when they ate with him, it's like in the rasa dance when the gopis were dancing with Krishna. So each gopi thought that Krishna was dancing with her and that she was the one who was having his full attention. So in that same way, the cowherd boys were eating uh, breakfast or lunch, I don't remember. But they were eating with Krishna and well, they were, and they were like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of cowherd boys and, and each of them thought that Krishna was just looking at them and like, sharing all these things with them. So this is the greatness of Lord Krishna and, and his sweetness where he exchanges. And he exchanges always according to the desire of the devotees. So it is also described in Brihad Bhagavatamrita that all the devotees in the spiritual world, there are innumerable, innumerable spiritual planets uh, where certain Supreme Personality of Godhead presides in a certain form, they are, of course, Lord Narayans, but there is also Lord Narasimhadev, Lord Varaha, Kurumadev, Matsya, and it is described how, uh, and also there are incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the form of uh, demigods. So there are devotees in the material world who worship the Lord according to these forms. And when they worship uh, the Lord according to this form, they meditate on this form. And when they meditate on that form, that is the form that they get in the spiritual world. And uh, this is also something that is shown by the example of Gopakumar, because Gopakumar, uh, he gets special mercy, and he is born on Govardhan, and he's a cowherd boy, he has his cows that he tends, and he gets the mantra when he meets the spiritual master. But he's always, he is a cowherd boy and he's always attracted to Lord Krishna who has a form of a cowherd boy. And in the end, when he goes to Goloka Vridavan, he is the cowherd boy. So this Madan Gopal on whom he was meditating all the time, uh, he got the form of his meditation. And I asked my spiritual master, like, does that mean that if uh, a person meditates on Srimati Radharani, does she, he or he get a, a, the form of a gopi? And he said yes, but he didn't want to go any deeper. But it's quite interesting how on the form that we meditate, we actually become that. And it's in, in the accordance with the Bhagavad Gita, where uh, Lord Krishna says that to, to whatever, whatever we have in our mind, to whatever we meditate, at the time of death, that's what we will achieve. So basically, if, for instance, a husband and wife are very much attached to each other and, um, and they are not Krishna conscious, <laughs> they're just living a plain material life, it happens that uh, if a woman is attached a lot to a man and thinks of him at the time of, of death, she will become, she will get a, a male body in the next life and vice versa. <laughs> if a man is attached to a woman, and thinks of her at the time of death, then he will get uh, the form, a female form, in the next life. Or if you are attached to a dog, <laughs> which some people are. <laughs> yeah, and because we have a, a story in Srimad Bhagavatam where, uh, what is his name? He was attached to a deer. Bharat, yes, Maharaj Bharat. He was attached to a deer and then. He was thinking about the deer and at that moment he left his body and that's the form that he got. So this is how it works. This is like uh, a law of, of Krishna.
like on what we meditate, that, that is what we will become. So, so we, st we stopped on the Gunja berries. <laughs> so uh, Krishna also has the forest garland of wild flowers. And leaves around Krishna's neck, he's superior to those ma made of parijata flowers from Svarga Luka. Because even in Vrindavan, all these uh, so-called devotees in neutral rasa, their neutral rasa is only because they don't have a specific service to the Lord. Uh, for instance, uh, if you read about the gopis, each of them has a specific service to the Lord. So, so do the cowherd boys. And, Mother Yashoda, and so if you are a devotee, you can meditate on a specific service. And also according to that specific service and the form of your meditation, you can get a certain uh, form, spiritual body. Um, but this neutral uh, rasas means that these devotees didn't have any uh, specific service that they meditated on for Krishna. So therefore, they are there to serve according to the pleasure of Krishna, whatever he needs, at that moment we will provide. But you can also see that there is a relationship, that there is a sweetness, that for instance the Yamuna river and the waves of Yamuna, they also worship uh, Lord Krishna when he walks around the banks of Yamuna. They want to touch his feet, uh, I mean Yamuna want, wants to touch the feet with uh, the waves from her water body. And the lotus flowers also, they bend and the trees that bear honey, they cry because uh, Krishna is uh, walking around. So, so this is like the intimacy of Vrindavan. And uh, yeah, and these forest flowers, they also have their purpose. Everything is conscious, so they are the, the ones who are, who are worn around Krishna. So that is the, the perfection of their life. So by mentioning the morsel of yogurt rice in Krishna's hand, this stick and horn, Brahma indicates the superiority of Krishna's cowherd boy from all over all others. In mentioning Krishna's lotus, uh, soft lotus feet, Mridupade, Brahma indicates that those wandering in the forest of Vrindavan become filled with ecstasy upon seeing Krishna's footprints. Shri Shri Radha Gopinata Ki Jai, Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki Jai, Shri Gorintai Ki Jai. So to repeat about Krishna's soft feet, Brahma indicates that those wandering in the forest of Vrindavan become filled with ecstasy upon seeing Krishna's footprints. So we all know that devotees, when they see Krishna's footprints, they become ecstatic. And therefore, the earth is also blessed because she was touched by the footprints of Lord Krishna. And we also uh, know uh, that uh, in Vaikuntha, uh, Lord Narayan uh, wears slippers. So he's not walking barefoot and leaving his uh, marks anywhere. And nobody actually gets to touch his lotus feet so much, except maybe someone who has the service of cleaning his uh, slippers. Or I think that uh, the queens, they wash his feet, not others. But here in the form of Krishna, Lord Shri Krishna, in Goloka Vrindavan, he walks barefoot and he leaves his marks everywhere. So, well, because everything is conscious, everything is alive, all of them are devotees, so they have this ecstasy um, of uh, his lotus feet. And to continue, from Vishwana Chakravati Thakur's purport, by stating that Krishna is the son of a cow, cow herder, Vasupa Angajaya, Brahma shows the superior fortune of Nanda over Vasudev. So again, uh, this intimacy is stressed because uh, Vasudev, you know, he's a, he's a king. Um, there is um, like the mood of awe and reverence. And we know that when Krishna appears as the son of Vasudev and Devaki, he appears as, first as a four-armed uh, Narayan in front of them. And then because of love, mother, motherly love of uh, Devaki, he transforms into a little baby. But Nandama, and, but, so they know who came. <laughs> they know that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the one who manifested in front of them, and then that he is their son now. But uh, Nanda Maharaj, he doesn't know, and Yashoda 
my she she doesn't know that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. And for example, when we talk about prayers, um, and we will talk about prayers <laughs> a little bit more. Um, when the residents of Vrindavan pray, they don't pray to Lord Krishna. They pray for, for Krishna, for his safety, for his protection to Lord Vishnu. <laughs> so basically, like, there is not, there's so much intimacy there and absence of knowledge that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that these prayers are actually, uh, how do you say, uh, they are um, uh, yeah, they are directed to Lord Vishnu, never to Krishna in that sense. So I found that interesting. Um, so this is like a meditation and glorification that uh, Lord Brahma spoke before he started his prayers uh, to Lord Krishna. And this uh, whole chapter is talking about how, it's actually inspiring us also how to pray to Lord Krishna and what is the purpose of prayer. And we also know that throughout Srimad Bhagavatam there are so many prayers like Queen Kunti prayers, Kanjendra prayers, Urva Maharaj prays, Prahlad Maharaj prays. So we see that this is one of the activities of devotional service and it's also put there to show us an example of how we should perform this kind of devotional service um, because usually people uh, when they pray they pray for something material that they gain like I don't know some people pray for a car some people pray for a good house good wife some people pray for good health so it's always something for me and even as devotees, we also pray in that sense. But uh, the real prayer for Krishna, this Vadanam, actually has a definition. And uh, it is given in one scripture that is called Shri Kaudya Kantahara. But uh, it doesn't matter where from, but it is from the scriptures. And it defines Vadanam that uh, the offering of prayers, so the person offers pray prayers to Krishna, to Krishna's lotus feet, when he, when he is deeply attached to Krishna through body, mind and words, and when he is in a helpless condition, and he is speaking to Krishna in a helpless manner. So we can see here how Lord Krishna, Lord Brahma, is attached to Lord Krishna, to his form as a cowherd boy. And there he, because of his attachment to this form, and because he is a devotee, he first of all, because this is a part of prayers, Vadanam, Vandanam, he uh, offers obeisances, Dandavat. So <coughs> part of Vandanam, offering prayers, is also offering obeisances. So this is also something that uh, Srila Prabhupada confirms uh, in his purpose. Because Vandanam and offering obeisances to Krishna is also a surrender. And there is a definition of surrender from Bhakti Hari, uh, Hari, Hari Bhakti Vilas. Just a second. And it's very nice. Yeah. So in Hari Bhakti Vilas, 11676, uh, there are six divisions of surrender. The six divisions of surrender are the acceptance of those things that are favorable to devotional service, the rejection of unfavorable things, the conviction that Krishna will give protection, the acceptance of the Lord as one's guardian or master, full surrender and humility. So if you think about all these six divisions of surrender, that is actually what is needed when you offer prayers. So we see that Lord Brahma was proud, but when he finally realized who is in front of him, who is Lord Krishna, that he wanted to bewilder, he becomes humble. So, and, uh, and he surrenders, he offers dandavats uh, to him and then offers prayers. And 
In a way, he accepts all that is favorable for his devotional service and rejects what is unfavorable. What is unfavorable for, unfavorable for his devotional service is, for example, that he is proud. <laughs> so he rejects that part and he accepts what is favorable for his devotional service, like offering prayers. And he is accepting whatever Krishna decides. So he is actually surrendering to the will of Krishna. And that is the mood in which we offer prayers, and that is the mood which Srila Prabhupada taught us to offer prayers. We know that uh, when Srila Prabhupada was sick, uh, and when devotees asked him, like, should we pray for you, uh, he said, yes, you should pray, but you should pray in a way that if Krishna desires so. So they would state, like, please, Lord Krishna, make Srila Prabhupada stay, make Srila Prabhupada healthy but if you so desire. So, uh, so this is like giving the control to Krishna. It's not our control. We, we surrender. We, we state our case of what we want, but actually we surrender everything to Krishna and it is on him uh, to decide actually what will be with our prayer. <laughs> um, but usually devotees, when they offer prayers, uh, they might, at the beginning, before they see Lord Krishna, they might have some anarthas in the sense that they have some material desires. For instance, Durva Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj uh, he wanted a kingdom greater than his grandfather Brahma and because he was so angry, because he was rejected to sit in the lap of his father. So he had these material desires out of anger, but when he saw Lord Krishna, uh, he forgot about all his desires and he just offered prayers and glorification. So we see like the mood of a devotee is always to glorify Krishna and whatever he prays for actually is the prayer for mercy. And this is what we will see in Lord Brahma's prayers. He glorifies him, he says like, yes, I know I should be punished because I acted in a wrong way, uh, but please be merciful unto me uh, because you are my mother, you are my father. I am actually born uh, from the lotus flower that comes from your navel. So as a mother doesn't take offenses of the child when the child kicks, uh, kicks her in the womb, well, she carries him in the same way, please uh, do not take my offenses. And then um, because he sees Lord Krishna as Guloka Vrindavan Krishna, he also sees what kind of relationship Lord Krishna has with the residents of Rajabhumi. Because he was looking like what Krishna was doing, how he was eating dirt, playing with his mother Yashoda, how she was binding him to a grinding mortar, uh, the relationship that he has with cowherd boys, with the gopis, and he finds, it, finds this amazing and totally intimate, and how it is impossible for him to approach it in a way. But he has a desire, because if he didn't have a desire, then he wouldn't glorify the residents of uh, Vrindavan, and he wouldn't say like, Please, I would like to be at least a blade of grass on which the Rajabasis walk on. Uh, so he had this prayer. And then I was listening uh, to Radhanath Swami's lecture and he concluded how everything is actually happening according to the will of Krishna. It was his arrangement. And Lord Brahma in our Sampradaya, his devotee, and we know that at the beginning of creation, when he was meditating on the Supreme Personality of Godhead by that voice that told him uh, that he should perform austerities, he also uh, get, got realizations and Krishna uh, gave him instructions through the heart. And uh, through the heart the Vedas were revealed to him. And he also had a meditation in his heart on this cowherd boy. So Krishna in a way showed him that form. And he wanted to serve that form. And he, we all know that we cannot get to Krishna if we don't serve his devotees. So in that same sense, Lord Brahma wanted to serve the re the, and follow the footsteps of the residents of Rajabhumi. And also because he was proud, what uh, Lord uh, Radhanath, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Radhanath Swami, what he emphasized is that uh, because he was so proud, he was so embarrassed by the way he was acting. So he, he in a way indicated that he would like to have a low birth like birth in a low family so that he could not be proud that he can actually exhibit the, the real humility. So this boon in a way was uh, granted to him 
uh, because he uh, he appeared as Haridas Thakur. So he was born in the really, really low family in the sense of the Arnashrama Dharma, let's say, like the like society, the structure of society, and also he belonged uh, to a Muslim family. And, uh, and uh, because of his devotion uh, and dedication to Lord Krishna, uh, he became uh, Namacharya uh, of our movement. So we know the whole story. So this is like some aspects, because I was also li listening to some lectures where it is said how uh, Gora Lila is actually a continuation of Krishna Lila. So there are so many aspects of what is going on in Srimad Bhagavatam, especially in the 10th chapter, 10th canto that we are reading. There are so many like things and puzzles that come together. Uh, like why this happened, we see when we go to Gora Lila. But that's another story. But this is just one, one puzzle, for example, how... Lord Brahma from Krishna Lila, how he entered into Gura Lila through through these prayers and through the mercy uh, of Krishna, he he gave him that position. So these are the examples uh, of how to pray, and uh, th as I emphasized, this is uh, one of the nine processes of performing the devotional service, praying. But we should also know that prayer is not only statements like this. It's also the songs that we sing. So our prayers, devotees' prayers, start from Mangalarati, when we sing to the spirit, songs of spiritual masters, uh, when we offer prayers to Lord Narasimhadev, when we offer uh, prayers to Tulasi Devi. So these are all prayers, songs, how, how devotees pray. Then we have Guru Puja. <laughs> so it's also a prayer. And before that, in the middle, we have Japa. And Japa is a prayer. So... We have this Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. A mantra uh, that is composed of 16 names of Krishna, but they all have a meaning. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, he was the most simple. He said, like, when we chant Japa, when we chant Maha Mantra, we are actually praying for service. So every time we say Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, we say to Krishna, please engage me in your service. So this is a prayer. And, uh, and it's not only like in Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya that because of the mantras in, or mantras in Hinduism, there, there are also like... Uh, vibrational, continuational uh, 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 repetition of certain words that also is done in other religions. So it's, it's also like a prayer and it's known there and it has a certain meaning and so on. So all these prayers are accepted by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But uh, I wanted to read a little bit like how Acharyas, uh, what, what meanings Acharyas give to the Maha Mantra because Maha Mantra is a prayer. So, uh, so I'll read a few because it's very nice for a meditation for your japa. So, meaning of the Maha Mantra from Hari Bhakti Vilas. So, first Hare. O Rade, please attract my mind and free me from material bondage. Krishna. O Krishna, please attract my mind by pulling it to you. Hare. O Radha, captivate my heart by showing me your incomparable sweetness. Krishna. O Krishna, purify my mind with knowledge about devotional service given by your pure devotees. Krishna. O Krishna, give me steadiness to appreciate your transcendental name, form, qualities, and pastimes. Krishna. O Krishna, may I develop a taste for serving you. Hare. O Rade, please make me qualified for your service. Hare, O Rade, please make me uh, eligible to relish your transcendental name, form, qualities, and pastimes. Hare, O Radha, please instruct me how I can serve you. Rama, O Krishna, let me hear of your intimate pastimes with your beloved Radharani. Hare, O oh, Radha, please reveal to me your pastimes with your beloved Madhava. Rama, O oh, Krishna, please reveal to me your pastimes with your beloved Srimati Radhika. Rama, 
O Krishna, please engage me in remembering your sweet name, form, qualities and pastimes. Rama, O Krishna, please make me qualified for your service. Hare, O Radha, having accepted me as one of your maidservants, please enjoy me as you like. Hare, O Radha, I beg you to be pleased with me. So, this is one example of how actually devotees have various meditations and various prayers when they recite also the Maha Mantra. But you can see that what Srila Prabhupada says as the, said as the essence, that like, let me be engaged in your service, is you can see it on each uh, sentence that we now read. It's all like a call for service because um, that is our constitutional position to serve Krishna and that is what fulfills us and that is actually our prayer. So this is what I have prepared a little bit about prayers. So if you have any questions or comments, you're more welcome. All, all the acharyas in our sampradaya they offered prayers all the time and we were speaking also about how devotees are poets but these poems that actually they speak are also prayers so all the songs of the acharyas Bhaktivino Thakur and Narutam Das Thakur they were all lamenting in a prayerful mood for mercy of Krishna mercy of Vaishnavas and so actually each Vaishnava, in a way, is an example of someone who, who is offering prayers to the Lord. But it, it's like there is, a, there is an intimate offering of prayers also, and there is an offering of prayers with awe and reverence. And in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, mostly uh, devotees offer with awe and reverence uh, prayers, like in a glorification and so on. There is not so much. Uh, I mean, there is intimacy, but not without oil and reverence. But we said, like, I mentioned that, that, that in a way, in Goloka Vindavan, it doesn't exist, because they, they also pray only to Vishnu. They don't pray to Krishna. They don't know Krishna is God. <laughs> so they just play with him. Yeah, it's a, there is one book who, that is written on the basis of the book of Teresa Avila. Uh, she was a, a saint from Spain and she was talking about uh, the power of prayer and how to connect with God because the God is situated in our heart and this heart we can imagine as a castle that has certain chambers. And then she would describe how prayers allow us to enter into each chamber until we finally get to this last chamber where we like unite with God. So, and then in this book, uh, which is based on her book, uh, these methods of prayers are also described and how, how, you know, this mantra prayer is also very much effective. But it should also be like, uh, connected with what we read, like how each, how each Acharya gave a meaning. This is also a prayer to the Maha Mantra. So it's like more personal. So it's not like you're repeating. You have to have a consciousness of like what you are doing, why you are doing. And so in this way, you connect with God. And uh, yeah, Jaipataka Jaipa Swami, he said that, uh, that actually uh, when the devotee prayers, prays to the Lord, he's actually having an intimate conversation with the Lord because it's only you and Krishna in the heart. And it's also the thing that you can do 24 hours a day. You don't have to speak about it. It's like all happening inside of you. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, you pray all the time. Yeah, it's quite much. I mean, in the end, all we do is pray. So, so that's what we do. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.